Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to e-commerce conversations, a podcast by practical e-commerce. What is going on, Internet? Eric Bandles back again with another e-commerce conversations. Hope all is going well on the other side of the internet. On the other side of the table, from me, the one and only Patrick Cadu. Welcome back to the show. Third time. Thank you very much. Is it only the third time? I feel like... I think it's three. We did one online, one in in Fort Worth, and now Austin. No, I think we did two in Fort Worth. Oh, really? Yeah, because one with James... And then That's one right. at your house. That's right. That's right. But a lot has changed. A lot has happened. It is a worthy episode for our regular listeners. What's new? Should I just jump right into it? <laughs> you know the show, man. We don't beat around the bush. <laughs> no need to. No long, drawn-out intro. Um, I have recently sold my business, Supply. Applause, I guess? Yeah. Or yeah. I assume applause. Yeah. It was a great outcome. It was not a, uh, <laughs> you know, I guess you could say some people, you know, fire sales or people sell but don't really want to sell. Well, I mean, there have been some sales recently of um, or disbanding of e-commerce brands that we've seen, you know, either couldn't get another funding or, you know, had to sell their brand for parts. So grateful that that's, that's not the case here for sure. The weird thing about selling a business is I feel like you kind of got to be secretive about it. You can never tell the public yeah. you're selling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you're Twitter. Yeah. I mean, so for us, I could see different circumstances, but for us, nobody knew outside of my wife and co-founder and then a few very key close friends. And those friends only knew because I needed like specific advice on things that those people I knew had experience in. And I think there were, there were like two of those people. And then otherwise, nobody knew. I don't even think, I didn't even tell my family yeah. until it was done. I don't know that the process you went through, yeah. were you seeking out buyers or yeah. did you just reply to emails? Because I get those emails all the time. Yeah, day. great question. I get those emails too. You know, they're usually not worth responding to, but we actually started a process to sell the business in March of last year, 2021. So we've been technically on the market for, for quite a while. And I'm happy to talk through the story. I think it's somewhat of an interesting one. It was a painful one at the time, but yeah, we went to market and, you know, there were a lot of people that looked at this deal, you know, dozens of them for sure. Were there only one offer or was there negotiations involved in that? Well, should we jump into it? The story? Yeah, do it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So we went to market. Long story short, there was a, you know, investment banker slash broker that I'd been talking to for at least a year or he had been talking to me. And he eventually convinced me to consider selling my business kind of late 2020. Things were going well at the time. We had a COVID bump. You know, we had washed Shark Tank out of our trailing 12 months, which is actually funny. One of the things I learned about going on Shark Tank was you don't want to sell. You're not really able to sell after Shark Tank because you get the nice bump and buyers want to be sure that that's not just like a one-time thing. And so you actually have to kind of wash (laughs) the Shark Tank success out of your trailing 12 so we'd watched that out. We had a great COVID bump. You know, things were looking good. And we decided, you know, I wasn't like, I got to sell this business. This is what we're doing. It was just like, you know, this kind of seems like the logical next step for us. It's either raise money or sell. And so we went. Why did you think you needed to raise money? Well, actually, that's not a fair dichotomy. It felt like we were kind of at an inflection point of either. Maybe there are kind of three choices. Just kind of keep growing like we were, which was fine. Nothing wrong with that. Um, bootstrapped you know, raise some money and like shoot for the stars or take some money off the table and sell and try to give it to somebody who could, you know, accelerate our growth with more capital and and expertise. And, you know, frankly, like, you know me, I think your listeners probably do. You know, I'm pretty open and honest guy. You know, at that point and still today, the business had gone far beyond anything I had ever expected, right? I always had big dreams and big visions, but, you know, I made this thing up in my cubicle, you know, as a you know, aeronautical engineer, you know, never thought it would become a multi-million dollar, you know, profitable business that was growing and doing well. 
So, you know, I was like, man, you know, this is something that's valuable. It would be worth considering selling and, you know, putting my family in a good financial position, right? Um, I don't need a hundred million dollar exit. You know, I'm a simple guy. I want to take care of my family and my kids, but otherwise I don't need hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, a meaningful kind of, when, when you look at just kind of EBITDA multiples out there and what we were doing at the time, you know, there was kind of a meaningful opportunity on the table, at least in theory. And so we went to market in March of 21. And then anybody who knows e-commerce knows what happened next, which was uh, iOS 14.5 hit. We don't need to talk about that. There's been tons of podcasts about that. But for us, I've always been pretty cards on the table that it, you know, it kind of destroyed our business. It not, not kind of, it destroyed our business overnight to where, you know, it was unsure if we were going to survive, uh, or at least I was unsure. We went from profitable, growing, you know, healthy business that a lot of people were interested in to, I mean, nobody was interested, you know, basically overnight. We went from profitable, growing to, you know, dying and unprofitable. So June, July, I've said this before, June and July were our first unprofitable months ever in the history of the business. And like nobody was interested, right? You know, nobody wants to buy something that's having trouble like that. So we were having great time. I mean, how do they know that though? Like, is it just like, oh, you've got two months of you're even in the red? Or I mean, like. As you're on market and people are interested in putting offers on the table, you know, they're asking, you know, for updated numbers. They're not going to give you an LOI unless they have updated numbers. And then also, I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to place myself back in that mindset, but I think. I was just being honest with people also yeah. like here's what's going on in the business right now. And I, yeah, I was also kind of doing some hand waving and saying, don't, don't pay attention to that. You know, everything's right. going to be fine, but you know, if you're a buyer, that's going to spook you, right? You know, a major change in trajectory and profitability. So it spooked a lot of people and we still tried to kind of push through it and, and tried to sell the business through the remainder of 2021. But as you're selling a business, any business, I mean, you're, you're almost always valued at, you know, a multiple of trailing 12 months EBITDA. That's what every buyer looks at, trailing 12 months EBITDA for a business of our size. So once you've got those, even though for us, it was only two or three months of poor performance, but once you've got that in your TTM, you're toast for the next 12 months. DTM, what is that? TTM trailing 12 months. Oh, TTM. TTM, yeah. So once you've got that in your P&L, your profit and loss, like you're toast, like you can't you got to you got to wash it out. So, we still tried to sell, but at the same time I still tried to save my business. So, I've talked about this before. I basically kind of rebuilt our marketing team from scratch, fired all the agencies, hired a bunch of internal green people, trained them, and sure enough, slowly but surely the business started to turn around. It wasn't overnight, but we started to see positive trends. To me, the process of selling a business seems like an entirely like almost like a full-time job yes. in of itself. Yes. And, and so you're now doing two jobs, yes. trying to sell the business yeah. and trying to fix the business. Oh yeah. It was awful. Like at any point during that process where you're like, ah, I'm going to give up on one or the other. No, no. I mean, it was one of the worst years of my life, just career wise. I was stressed and anxious about the business. You know, that's just enough to give you a hard time. Mm-hmm. Not sure if it was going to survive, but then at the same time, I was trying to sell it, right? So you're very perceptive in that you keyed in on like the most difficult part of like the last 12 months. I never gave, I certainly didn't give up on the business, right? I mean, I doubled yeah. down actually. And at the same time, I was hopeful that I could be successful in convincing people, hey, I know we've had this rough go, but trust me, like things are getting better. But in reality, I should have taken a step back and been like, okay, we had a bad go, you know, pause the acquisition efforts, come back in another year. Yeah. That's what I should have done. How old was your business at the time? Three, four years? Uh, at the time, six years old. Oh, six years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we started in 2015, but like for all intents and purposes, for like meaningful revenue, maybe we're three or four years old. Four years, four years old, let's call it four. So I should have paused, but I kept going, you know. I couldn't tell you why. Maybe I just thought I could still sell it, you know. Should have hit pause. So... Tried to sell the business. I will say, though, it, it became less of a priority for me. It, it took kind of backseat to rebuilding the business. And uh, so anyways, fall of last year looked okay. Q4 looked even better. Q1 was really good. Q2 was 
fantastic. So like just things started to get a lot better. And so by this spring, now we're fast forward to May of this year, April, May of this year, you know, we were getting close to what I keep calling washing out those, those bad months. And we were like, okay, now's the time to kind of go back to the market and say, Hey, look at me now. Look what I did. We're about to have a really killer TTM. Who's interested in in talking? And at, at that time, most people, so the landscape has really changed. Yeah. So the people we were talking to in 2021 last year, there was a lot, people who listen to the show probably know there was a lot of money that was raised in e-com aggregators last year. Tons, billions of dollars, dozens of companies. So there were a lot of people looking at that time. There still are, but fast forward you know, to this year, there's not as many people looking. There's not as much money. They're not just throwing around money like drunken sailors. So we went back in May, April to to the market and said, hey, look, look at us now. Aren't we, you know, great. We turned things around. Don't you want to buy us now? And most people were like, uh, yeah, it's interesting. But, you know, either our strategy has changed or our money has dried up or, you know, one of the things I got was we've gone upstream in terms of we're only buying, you know, bigger businesses mm-hmm. now. So a lot of people's strategies had changed or like they weren't interested in the market anymore, the grooming, men's grooming market. So the list of people that were interested, you know, went from, you know, a dozen plus uh, at our original pass to, you know, a few on our second pass. So we got some offers, but anyways, we did get some offers. Did you get offers in the first time around? Um, We did. None of them. So I'm trying to, re- I'm actually remembering as we go here, because man, there's a lot that happened. We actually did get some offers over this last summer. So like, even though things were going poorly, we did get some offers. None of them were good. They were terrible. Okay. Yeah. So it was better to not just yeah. accept those and fix yeah. the business. And- yeah. I had actually forgotten that part of the story. We did get a couple of, I mean, but they were not. Like below the three to five EBITDA. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, two-ish maybe. And at that point, you know, our EBITDA was not great, so... Not meaningful, not anything I would have sold for. I don't remember the numbers, but I remember not being impressed with the offers. But come April this year, we got some better offers. And so long story short, we negotiated one and ended up signing an LOI, which, uh, you know, for the audience is a letter of intent. You know, basically the process is when you sell a business, you sign an LOI, which is like a two page, three page paper that's like, here's what we think the business is worth and, you know, kind of general terms. None of it's binding, but it it basically binds you to not sell your business to anybody else for the next like 60 days. And that gives you and the buyer a chance to do due diligence. And they basically confirm what you told us was actually true. They, you know, they go through, it's, you know, it's open heart surgery. They go through everything. And now that's when the real work begins is post LOI. So happy to go into that, but long story short, LOI, two months to do due diligence, negotiate the final closing documents, and then close. And so we closed in August of this year, so a couple months ago. So you're happy with it then? I am, yeah. There's at least once or twice a week where I think, man, I shouldn't have sold my business. Because <laughs> <laughs> I still very, I, you know. If, well, you're still working there, I'm right? still working there. I still very much believe in the business. In fact, I believe the best days are ahead. But, you know, there's... There's a lot of personal decisions and emotions that go into selling a business and why you want to sell when you sell. And so, you know, the overarching emotion is like gratitude. You know, we're in a really, um, you know, never thought we would have had this outcome. And then just kind of like relief, not in the sense that I got something bad off of my shoulders, but like also in the sense that, you know, I have over the past 12 to 18 months a lot of which is due to the sale process, become very stressed, very burnt out, and just very weighed down by the weight of running this business. And frankly, well, I, I mean, just ahead. from knowing you yeah, for however many years I've known yeah. you, I think you've also been stressed before that when you were like yeah. a, essentially like a one man yeah, or like a husband wife team building yeah. this up. Yeah. And I think that I don't, I don't know what that is, if that's my personality or you know, all entrepreneurs experience that in different ways, but you know, the, the stakes have always felt high to me. I think it's because I place them high. Like there are times you weren't even replying to my texts because you were just too bummed out <laughs> with your business. Like, <laughs> Yeah. It's funny. It's not, 
for me, I don't know why this is my personality, but I'm always focused on what's wrong in my business and never what's right. Like mm-hmm. the reality is I've built an amazing business. Like, you know, this is kind of the American dream, what we just accomplished. But I don't tend to think about that on the day-to-day basis. But then the other piece is post-sale, man, I haven't been this happy in a long time. And the reason, so it's funny, my mother-in-law's in town this week and she goes, you know, do you dread going to work? And I said, I haven't enjoyed work this much in years. And it kind of reminds me of the early days of like when I got to actually do the work I loved without the kind of weight of all the other stuff, the accounting and the, you know, just there's always something on fire. And maybe it's due to, you know, my uh, mistakes, maybe some mistakes in building my business, but all those fires ended up on my, the, the more the company grew, the bigger the fires got and the more they ended up on my desk. Yeah. And now those fires are, in a certain sense, starting to be on other people's desks. And I get to do what I love to do now. So like, I love going to work. Whereas six months ago, I don't think I'd love I kind of, I kind of want to talk about, I want to talk about that. I want to call it your failure in building a business of your dreams. Yeah. Yeah. And like, how do we go back? How do we learn from this? Cause mm. you know, before we hit record, you're talking about the next business. Sure. And then like, I've always kind of had this mindset is like selling a business doesn't fix the problem. Yeah. It allows you to, you know, like get capital for bigger projects sure. or, you know, if you want to live on the beach or, or whatever else you want to do. But if there's something wrong with the business, yeah, which is all the fires came to you, yeah, selling the business doesn't fix that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in a sense it does because now you're an employee. Yes. But if you do another business, how are you going to do it different so that the fires don't land up on your shoulders? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I do think about this a lot. And, you know, we talk about next business, you know, whether that's two years from now or 10 years from now, or if there even is a next one. But what I think about a lot is how I would build, I would take less, um, I don't want to say responsibility, but like I would expect more from my teammates, my team members. And I'm starting to do this in my business now, actually. I'm pulling myself out of meetings, taking myself off of emails, you know, slacks, and I'm just saying, you figure it out. You know, when people come to me with problems, you know, in some senses, like I may know the answer, but I'm actually going to let people kind of sit and flounder and try to figure out the answer because that's going to be really good for them. Do you find it hard to sit on your thumbs and not say anything when you know a really good way to solve that problem? I find it hard to find the balance between training employees and like, offering wisdom that would help them, right? Because I, I don't want to withhold wisdom that would benefit them, right? I mean, but finding the balance between that and then also just letting them figure things out, you know? And so I, I don't know what the right balance is there, you know, but back to your question about what I'd do different, you know, I would think I would think a lot harder up front about how to build a team or, you know, delegate responsibility so that things, decisions are made outside of my purview without my involvement i think that is the one beauty of selling a business is assuming you have more capital now like because a team costs five thousand dollars per person sure so if you have a team of four people that's twenty thousand dollars a month that you're expecting yep and then you have higher expectations for growth of course yep and then higher burn rates too i mean like it's just kind of like for me like bootstrapping starting with, you know, your own talent. Yeah. You know, you can always go down to one. Yeah. And I guess that's always kind of been the comfort that I have at Beard Brand is like, if it all goes down to zero, yeah, it's really all just going to go down to one. Yeah. Or two, like me and Lindsay. And sure. And there's enough business out there to kind of support two people, I think. So that's kind of been like, it's not going to zero. Yeah. No. The problem is, and I think you may relate to this, is... I'm no longer good at the things that it requires to be a company of one or I could be good, but like I have no interest in doing some of those things. Well, that's what I was going to say next is like, (laughs) I've lost that skill of doing. Um, Yeah. I've been talking about this a lot lately. There's four types of employees. Yeah. Those who think and those who do, they do both. Those who think, but they don't do. That's me right now. (laughs) (laughs) Those who do, but they don't think they just follow an SOP. And then, of course, those who don't think or do, which is probably most of the candidates who get on a job application. <laughs> That's good. I've never heard that framework. That's really good. Yeah. So it's, you know, certain roles like the growth marketer, I just want someone who can think and do because it's yeah. constantly like 
what's going on with the ads? Why yep. are these ads working? How do I come up with new ads? Yep. And then you have to do them. Yep. Whereas a CEO, like if your expectation is that you're doing all these things, yeah. you're going to have no bandwidth to think. Yep. And kind of like your job is as much as possible to think about the future. Yeah. And- yeah. It's funny. I've been doing a lot of things. You know, there's, there's a lot of reflection that happens after you sell a business. You know, one of them is like, for me, it was like thinking about all the people along the way that helped me, you know, like I owe my success to a lot of people, even just friendships, right? So you're on that list, just having somebody you can talk to, you know, somebody that took like one call with you and gave you a piece of advice that like changed your business. So that's one thing you think about. The other thing you reflect on is like, who am I now? Like for me, it's been like, what am I good at? Like what, like kind of, you're, you're in a new phase of your career. Like I'm still at supply. My job is still the same. My team is all still with me like almost nothing has changed about the business but like there's a lot of reflection about okay so what what am i good at and and what do i want to be and (laughs) i don't know it's kind of weird because the person i've had to be over the past seven years has been outrageously different over the years depending on the requirements of the business from the very beginning where it was just an idea and making that idea reality to today when i've got 15 people you know and trying to run a business so how do you Introduce yourself at uh, networking events or whatever. I haven't. That's funny. I d- went to my first deal last night and I struggled with like, do I, you know, I'm a, I am founded a razor. I, uh, there's nothing past tense because I'm still running the company, yeah. but like, I don't know. You'll always be the founder of supply. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you completely sell it and you're right, you know, not, sitting on the beach. Not involved anymore. Yeah, it's funny. I don't I don't know what the answer to that is. I haven't had to really do that much. My signature still says founder slash CEO yeah. in my email. Not that that matters, but I look at that every now and then. I'm like, well, technically I'm not the CEO anymore. Um, but I, I like that title, so. <laughs> I don't like the title CEO. <laughs> I guess technically I'm brand manager because, okay. right, the company that bought us has a bunch of brands and you know, I'm the brand manager for supply. So it just doesn't have the same ring to it. So maybe I'll just go to founder. Yeah. I mean, I like founder <laughs> because it's, I don't know. It's yeah. just I'm going to take a hard left here. But what's funny is I learned, I forget who I was talking to yesterday, but the person who scaled, oh, I remember who I was talking to. The person who scaled Spanx actually wasn't Sarah Blakely. And I just heard this from one person. So forgive me if I'm wrong here, but you know, a lot of the success stories you see about, you know, this founder who's a king or a queen, you know, that started this amazing company, a lot of times the founder isn't the one who actually built the amazing business. Yeah, like Honest and Jessica yeah, Alba. Honest. I think about, and I don't really know much about his business, but Chris Powers, who's a guy on a Twitter, Twitter celebrity and a friend of mine who lives in Fort Worth, you know, he started this amazing company. And then he talks about how he actually found a CEO to run the company because he realized he wasn't, you know, the right guy in that seat. And so I'm still thinking through this. So right now I'm actually thinking out loud on a public podcast. But like, I think one of my realizations is I'm a really good founder. I don't know if I'm like a CEO for like, for for a sub $10 million brand. Great. That's fine. I can be a CEO. But like for a $20 million plus brand and 50 people, that's not me. I'm a, Dude, found, I'm a starter, not a scaler. I think that's why I don't really appeal or the title CEO doesn't appeal yeah, to me. It's yeah. because like I still don't imagine myself doing things that a, a quote unquote real CEO yeah. is doing. Yeah. I'm a problem solver. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a fire putter outer. Yeah. I'm an ideas guy. Yeah. And that that may be why I've had a little bit more stress and a little less fun over the past couple of years is because I was transitioning out of the founder role into the, you know, quote CEO role, building the team and I enjoy building a team. I enjoy, it's not that I don't like people, but when I get excited about things, it's always about new ideas and new products and new businesses. And, you know, even, you know, the ideas never stop coming, Yeah, you know. In EOS, there's the visionary integrator. Right. You never had an integrator? I never had an integrator. I think that would have changed things a lot for me because I'm definitely the visionary for sure. Yeah. I mean... My business partner, Lindsay, she kind of serves in the integrator role, yeah. but it's, I don't know, we're at a slower pace sure. to build in everything. So it's kind of like a, a neutered, I don't want to say she's neutered in any way, but like yeah, yeah. just the decisions that we've made as a team to going back to your three choices when you sold the company, yeah. like go at a nice pace, 
go balls of the wall, get yeah. some investment or sell. Yeah. Or kind of that nice pace and the yeah. trade-offs that come with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's not like life or death if you get a certain decision wrong and you don't have VCs breathing down your neck. Oh and you know, I don't know how people do that. Yeah. But of course, I'm not building a business to- Everybody's different. To get on the cover of Forbes magazine. Yeah. I just want my commercial. <laughs> yeah, ship station. <laughs> ship station. I still see that. I saw it like two weeks ago. I must be making them a ton of money because they've been running that for like five years. You should have negotiated some kind of royalty. I know. Well, you know, that's what you get for not being a union mm-hmm. actor. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, like you got a new website, pat.coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have a new website. People hated that when I posted that idea on Twitter. So sounds like canoe.com is my new website. Yeah. That's a great name because your last name is Kadu. Kadu. Yep. So yep. it sounds like canoe. Yep. And everyone, I would imagine, got it wrong before. Oh, yeah. The tagline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's my new website. I, you know, one of the things I'm going to do, I, this may sound, uh, I don't know if this sounds like self-serving or uh, insincere, but like, as I said before, one of the things I reflect on is the help I received from people along the way that really helped me a lot. So advice, you know, friendship, you know, mentorship, whatever was key to me getting where I got, getting where, getting, getting where I got. Yeah. We're in Um, Texas. Yeah. We're in Texas. Anyway, so one of the things I'm going to start doing, and this is not like a new career for me, this is just something that I think would be fun, is consulting and coaching a little bit. And I'm talking like an hour or two a week for just people I like. So I'm going to set up a website and, you know, if people want to book some time with me, they can. Like You fill out a whatever. form and see if he likes you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, like... you can apply to the wait list or whatever. But So I'm going to start doing that a little bit on the side. Still running supply full-time, so that's my full-time job right now. But that for me would be, I think, a lot of fun to number one, help people. And then number two, just kind of, you know, learn also from other people, kind of stay in the. I think one of the fun things about you running this podcast is you kind of get to stay in the game a little bit with, not that you're not in the game, but outside of Beard Brand, you know, kind of pick people's brains and that sort of thing. So that'll be an outlet for me. So I'm going to set up a silly little website and we'll see what happens. Every Friday, you've got the opportunity to work on that, right? I do, yeah. I, did I tell you I don't work Fridays anymore? Yeah, so I'm I'm not working Fridays. Do you think that is something that you could have achieved before you sold? Like, if I was like, my goal now is I don't yeah. want to work Fridays. Sure. I need to set up the processes that allow me to. Because the processes now work. The company's yeah. doing yeah. as good, if not better than ever. Yeah. And you're working one less day. Yeah. So... The trajectory was there and there was always the intention to get there, whether we sold or not. not. And not like specifically not to work Fridays, but, you know, I had realized that the pace I was running at was not sustainable. You know, it was affecting my mental health, my physical health, you know. So there was a lot of work being done. You know, we've talked about, I think on our last podcast, you know, EOS I put in place to try to build this company that could run itself without me being involved in everything. And so that trajectory was there and... You know, I'm a big believer that work expands to fill the time that you give it, right? So I work really hard on Mondays and Thursdays in the time allotted, and I take Fridays off. And now I'm, you know, I'm happier, I'm less stressed, I get to enjoy more time with my family. And actually, I get the same amount of work done and enjoy it more because I'm not sitting around, you know, I'm not wasting any time. Yeah. I love to waste time. (laughs) That is like my favorite way to work. If I could have a 12-hour workday. Yeah. But that like half of it is me just browsing YouTube videos and and Twitter. It would be like a dream come true. I'm the opposite, man. I want to get it done in the time I've got so that I like, I want to waste time on a Friday quote, waste time. Like I don't want to, you know, I want to get all my work done so that I can have like a three day weekend instead of just wasting that one day, you know, in between. No, I could have seven, 12 hour days of work. No, not me. And just be super inefficient. I think I'm the only guy out there who wants to be inefficient at work. (laughs) No, I don't think you're the only guy out there. I know know a lot of employees like to be inefficient. (laughs) The only founder. Yeah, the (laughs) The only only founder. (laughs) I don't know. It's just, it's like a lower, I just, for me, I just, I guess I dig the lower stress. I get the feeling because I have that now taking Fridays off, right? Because my stress level has gone down immensely and I enjoy work better. So it's kind of like the same thing, just different. Like yeah, yeah. Three days off, man, I'm ready to go get back at it for four days. So 
Sweet, it's been man. my experience. Where else can people contact you? So we got soundslikecanoe.com. <laughs> yeah, which is nothing right now, but <laughs> maybe by the sounds time... Sounds like this... canoe. I said sounds like canoe. Yeah, sounds like canoe.com. Maybe I'll have some semblance of a tiny little website by the time this podcast launches. Or just find me on Twitter. It sounds like canoe. Yeah. Sounds like canoe because my last name is Kadu. There you go. Yeah. Patrick, thanks again for coming down to Austin on your free day. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. I think we could probably talk for hours and maybe one day we will if we expand the podcast. I think so. We'll do like a two hour episode, like a Joe Rogan style. Yeah. And then we'll just like really pull back the curtain rod. Yeah. Nobody will listen. But we'll have fun. <laughs> All right, guys, this has been another e-commerce conversations. Hope you learned as much as I did. And if not, I hope you enjoyed it. Cheers. Keep on growing. Bye.